Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Christopher Brown. Today's guest was the MLA for Calgary Bow from 2015 to 2019. Deborah Drever and I sit down and we talk about her sense of duty, the 2016 Safer Space for Victims of Domestic Violence Private Members Bill that she introduced and passed, and also social media. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Cross Border Interviews featuring Deborah Drever. Thank you for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, I feel honored that your first podcast is mine, so greatly appreciate it. Yes, this is a bucket list for me, so thank you for having me. (laughs) Always. Um, As I start with every politician, former politician, where does your sense of duty come from? Where did your sense of duty to get elected to run for politics come from? Mm -hmm. Well, I have, I've gotten this question a lot um, during my time as an MLA and even now. Um, Basically, my family's very political. My sister, Jen, worked for Nikki Ashton for many years. She was her campaign manager during the leadership race with the NDP. And so I've always been involved with the NDP in some capacity. Um, But when they asked me to run, um, at that time, I was more so just volunteering and I wasn't putting a ton of time, right? But, um, you know, it was the orange wave at that time. They were looking for more female candidates and... Literally, I remember the day that I got the phone call. I was at MRU. I was in the library. I was studying for a final. And then it's like, we want you to run. Um, we think that you understand the issues. We want we want more women to run. And, um, you know, I've always been a bit of an activist myself. And I thought, yeah, why not? You know, and that's really what drove me is that there aren't a lot of women or there wasn't at the time a lot of women politici- politicians especially younger people so I thought it was important to have like a different voice so um, <coughs> that, that's 20, the 2015 campaign yeah so prior to the 2015 campaign had you had uh, interest in politics were you out there because you talk about your sister campaigning for Nikki Ashton yeah but were you out there helping out on former NDP campaigns whether, whether it be federally or locally or even municipally I know yeah. they don't have politics uh, party politics yeah but helping out municipally as well uh no actually I never worked on a campaign oh wow uh, I just went to different events and I was kind of trying to figure out like what the NDP was all about like this was my very early beginnings of like politicians and politics and what does it mean and all that so I um I thought I was really fascinated by the whole thing and that's why I was interested in helping out in, in whatever capacity I could but um no I never worked on a campaign so take me through the process. So you get that call when you're sitting in the library at the MRU. Yeah. Who's the first person you call? Because that's a big decision to put yourself out there in a public way, right? So who's the first person you call? Is it your parents? Is it your sister? Or is it, you know what? I'm going to just do it myself. I'm old enough. I'm just going to put my name out there. It was my sister. Okay. <laughs> and I was like, what just happened? <laughs> Why didn't they ask you? Did that crash your mind? Did she live in Calgary as well at the time? Uh, she never really wanted to be a politician. She liked to do things behind the scenes. Okay. Um, and she was the one trying to motivate me the most to do it. She was pushing me the most, and she was really encouraging. And without her push, I mean, as you know, a lot of women have to be asked to run, right? If no one asked me, I probably wouldn't have done it. Really? Now, yeah. was uh, Calgary both the... Like that was the riding they wanted you to run in, yeah. or because yeah. you lived in you've lived in Calgary, both from that was taken for your whole life. Um, off and on. Okay. Yeah, I lived in Bonas for a long time. My dad lived in Cougar Ridge. Um, I dated a guy who lived in Coach Hill. <laughs> um, <laughs> either way, but yeah, no, I lived in Bonas for quite a number of years, and. Um, yeah, so I think what happened was they were like, we're going to assign you a writing. Well, we don't know right now, but we'll let you know. Yeah. And then... So had you talked to the then uh, third party leader, fourth party leader, uh, Rachel Notley at that time, to say, hey, I'm your candidate in Calgary Bow, or was this a complete, we're going to put you in and then she'll come and talk to you later? Yeah, no, that never happened. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, yeah, so what happened, how I met Rachel was yeah. I went to a Joe CC camp pain and uh, a rally and that's where I met Rachel for the first time and I remember there were swarms of people this was in Inglewood everyone was swarming around her as they usually do and I was like you know hey Rachel I just want to introduce myself I'm running for your party in Calgary Bow and I'm so excited and it was literally like a 20 second conversation but it really um, made me feel pretty good so yeah oh that's good 
good. Yeah. So you hit the ground running. The election gets called. I'm assuming uh, you get the call prior to the election being called. Uh, yes. So the election wasn't supposed to happen for a few years because we have election laws in this country, a province, yeah. which some people didn't seem to mind foregoing in 2015. So they went to the ele- to an election early. You're a student yeah. at this time, so mm-hmm. do you drop everything what you're doing and focus heavily on the campaign, or do you say, okay, we, we have to balance this out. We have to door knock at night and go to school during the day. Yeah, so this was during finals. <laughs> Which is, you so, know, an easy time to begin with. <laughs> yeah, so I had to do my finals and study for them and campaign at the same time. Now, to be fair, the beginning of the whole thing, I did not know what I was doing. Everything was new to me because I never worked on a campaign before. Yeah. Um, so the person that my mom was dating at the time, um, he actually said he worked on campaigns. He's like, I want to be your campaign manager. Literally everything was DIY. We did everything ourselves. We got our group of volunteers. We door knocked. And um, at the same time, um, I was studying for my finals and I did what I could at the time. But um, so, yeah, Alberta. Not very uh, prominently known to be an NDP safe haven or even Calgary. At what point during that election did you think, what's happening here? There's a change that's happening and we could potentially win this thing. When was that for you? Because when when I've talked to your former colleagues, uh, some have said, well, it was after the debate with uh, Rachel and Jim Prentice. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe it was when you started noticing more people being receptive at the door. When was it for you? Yeah, that's a really good question. (laughs) Um, Because actually, even when they asked me to run, I heard many times from many Many different people I'm not gonna win I'm not gonna win yeah. don't expect to win you're just a name on the ballot and I thought you know what no like that motivated me even more to actually go out there on the steps to door knock to talk to people um, and when I did talk to them they were really excited about Rachel's vision for Alberta and that for me that was like wow people are really serious about this and they were t- like I heard so many times I've never voted NDP in my life this is the first time I'm voting NDP but I'm so proud to do it I think that Alberta needs to move forward I'm tired of the whole old conservative entitlements and we need to get rid of that and we need a new vision and yeah and your your writing it's got very bow was a uh, 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 it wasn't held by an incumbent. The incumbent decided to step down. That's uh, right. Atlanta, so yeah, Atlanta. I, DeLong. Yes, DeLong, yeah. sorry. Um, so she decided to step down. Then she moved to BC to run there for the Liberals, but <laughs> yeah. we, we won't go she there. She actually ran for the uh, federal um, poll, uh, election that just happened as well, and also lost to a new Democrat. So. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so there you go. So yeah. you were running against a uh, unknown quantity of Byron Nelson, yes, uh, Wild Rose, and you had a split there, and then yourself. So uh, actually, I had six. Oh, people. you had six. Yes, I had Greens, Liberals, me, Wild Rose, Conservative, uh, and so an Independent. There was or? someone else. Alberta Party. Oh, okay, yeah, because yeah. they were Greg. Uh, Greg Clark was probably still trying to yeah get his full slate. So yeah. you're going through. You have that thought in your head I'm gonna win this I need to win this because people are telling me I'm not gonna win this yeah uh I believe it's May 5th rolls around yeah election night take me through your process of <laughs> what what was going through your head when you saw your name come up with your photo and a little elect it with a check mark yeah come across so what was going through your head because oh yeah I, I, I've, I've ran for politics. I've only seen the check mark defeat it. Oh, <laughs> so yes, I know. what was yours yeah. like? So we had a big party at the Opera House in Calgary. Mm-hmm. And it was jam-packed. Um, so many people were there. And I remember I was surrounded by my friends and family. And my grandma was standing in front of me. And I was refreshing my phone like every two <laughs> seconds to, you know, see the results. And I just remember that little green check mark beh- beside my name. And I said what does this mean (laughs) they're like it means you got elected and I burst into tears I was so happy because I just didn't think it was going to happen but it did so wow it was really cool yeah so you're you're having a party you've now been officially elected 54 people across the province 54 or 53 54 yeah 54 54 across the riding well 53 because there was one riding that went to recount that's right yes and and the Johnsons and yes um so you're you're celebrating the night away. So you've just gone from being a student to an elected official. Yes. What 
the what the hell? Like I I would be sitting there going, okay, this changes my life completely now. Yeah. So yeah. How how did you prepare to change that? Because you've gone from being a private person to being scrutinized by the media yeah. to being scrutinized by the opposition, by the third party, by everyone. Mm-hmm. How how take me through that process for you? Yeah. I mean, I wasn't fully prepared to be honest with you. Um, I kind of took it step by step, and then you know I'm sure we're gonna get to this, but the day after what everything happened with the media that kind of put um, a big wrench into things and I I pretty much had to make the decision to stop, just quit my degree at the time I was gonna finish it I always wanted to finish my degree and that's why I'm back in school now but um, yeah so I just wanted to focus on my job I wanted to take it very seriously um, and kind of learn as I go yep. it's a steep learning curve right you don't not everyone knows everything especially when you're new to politics so yeah, yeah. so you did broach the subject and we'll talk about it for a short period of time but I do want to preamble this yeah. and that's why I wanted to talk to you because during my tw- the 2015 federal election I was the liberal candidate up in Peace River West Lock oh, okay and uh, federally or provincial? federally okay in 2015 on September 10th I know the day I remember I was driving into Edmonton for a event with the Justin Trudeau Mm -hmm. and I got a call from a staffer from Ottawa saying stop where you are turn around because we can't have you with the leader at all because the conservatives have released some of your past social media tweets oh yes so I basically became that poster child of Northern Alberta liberal and there was a few things that uh, I had said on Twitter while I was drunk after I lost a partner uh, to a drunk driver so I lashed out on media and like uh, as, as you said once I got the call from the party that they needed a candidate they said you're not going to win we just need someone on the, on the ballot. ballot so uh, 2015 they they had said that you're not going to win we just need a name ballot only so they didn't do the proper vetting on their side and I didn't either because I thought lonely person in northern Alberta like who's really going to check but at the same time I wasn't really thinking that people did that right because this yeah. was the, that was the first election where social media was prominent so I never got to the other side where I got elected and then they came out so right. when you got that first notification that your uh, past had come back to haunt you mm-hmm. what was the initial thought <clears throat> so it was literally the day after I was elected May 6th I was getting a lot of weird messages from people I haven't talked to in years. And they were like, you really need to delete everything right now. Just delete it. But they didn't explain why. Yeah. I'm like, what is going on? And so I actually, I want to put something on the record. Is that my entire social media, everything was set to private. Everything. Only my closest friends are really on that list. So I find it very strange that all this came out. I learned later that apparently someone hired some guy in Las Vegas to look for um, sketchy things about politicians or yep. candidates. And that's how they, they must have hacked into it. I'm not totally sure, but either way. Um, they found it. They found it. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, hey, I don't know what to do right now. I wasn't given any direction on what to do. So I went to my mom's house and I'm like, what should I do? And they're like, they were helping me lock everything down and delete everything. But it was too late at that point. Everything kind of came out. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So we go forward. We talk. We get to the legislature. Yes. You're sitting as an independent. Mm -hmm. Um, What was that first moment when you walked into that building (laughs) as an elected official and you're going, Holy crap! I I I don't want to say made it, but I'm here. I, I'm gonna I'm in the epicenter of political activity for all of Alberta yeah. as a new Democrat or yes. as an independent. I've made it. Yeah. What was that like for you? It was intimidating. <laughs> Just seeing the outside of the legislature was like, wow, what a beautiful building! Like, I can't believe I'm gonna be working here for the next four years and. Uh, and yeah, then we had our training session where the speaker kind of explains how things are done and the procedure. And um, I was actually running late that day. So <laughs> I was like running up the marble stairs and the security guards like, oh, late to school, aren't you? And I'm like, oh, God, this is not a good first impression. <laughs> 
So, um, and I remember going into the chamber and the pages were like, oh, you're sitting on, you're sitting over there. I'm like, where? They're like, way over there. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I'm, I'm like, okay. So I go to my corner. I, I like to call it the naughty corner. And, uh, and you know, I, there's a kinda, few people that got sent exactly, to that. That's <laughs> why I call it the naughty corner. Yeah. You gotta make a little bit of a, not everything has to be so grim. Right. Yeah. But either way, um, it was, it was really humbling. Yep. Going from student life to, to that. Yeah. So the first day, um, you're with all the other elected officials, the ones who had been there elected beforehand, re-elected, yes. uh, people who had won the first time. Um, that's when you start making the friendships, even across party lines. Because the great thing that I, I, I've learned over the last two, three months when I'm talking to former politicians and politicians is... Question period is question period. Mm -hmm. It's a spectacle because that's the clip that you use on the evening news. Right. But overall, you get to know people from across party lines. So when you get into the legislature, are you talking with the PCs? Are you talking with the Wild Rose? Are you talking with the Liberals, the Alberta Party, your fellow NDP colleagues as well? Or are you just, okay, I need to focus on this. I need to make sure this is done correctly. Yeah. Um... I was intimidated, so I didn't really feel like talking to a whole lot of people at that time, but I did have a lot of people come to me and was like, you know, I'm really sorry that this happened to you and good for you for sticking it out and just so you know, like, we're thinking of you kind of thing. And so I sat um, in the corner with Greg Clark and David Swan. And um, so I got to know them really well. And okay. um, yeah, I mean, they were great guys. Uh, David Swan kind of amused me at times because <laughs> he would kind of drift in and out. And a lot of the times he was kind of like, what are we doing? And <laughs> he's not running again. So it's, <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. But uh, so Greg Clark would have to explain everything to him. And he's like, OK, so I'm voting this way. <laughs> Okay, like what is going on? So, this is not how I pictured politics. No, no, no. So I mean, I'm in the back, kind of laughing to myself. But uh, yeah, I mean, I would. So in the chamber, I don't know if everyone knows this, but um, you can pass notes. And so um, I was passing a lot of notes. I already knew Michael Connolly from before. Um, he was really good friends with my sister Jen, and so him and I would talk a lot. Um, and yeah, I really got to know like Brian Mason. He was my mentor, really. I would meet with him on a monthly basis and give him updates on what I was doing. And While you were sitting yeah. as an independent. Yeah. So uh, the big uh, amendment that you passed while you were sitting as an uh, independent and, uh, MLA, yeah. I want to make sure I get this right here, is yeah. the safer spaces for victims of domestic violence. Yes. How did this come about? Talk to me through how you got this idea to the bill passage. Yeah, so... What happened was, um, everyone has a chance to do a private member's bill. Not so much anymore, but yeah. they used to. Yeah. <laughs> um, and how that worked was there was a draw between 1 and 87 people, because there's 87 seats in the House. And if you have between 1 and 10, you really have a good chance of at least um, going into first reading to present the bill. Um, and I was number four. So that's why I was like, okay, I really need to take action on this. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. So how does the draw work? Like, is it yeah. just you're number four because you're D? Or are it's you number four? Like, draw. literally everyone pulls a number out of a hat. I don't know how they do the draw, but there's a draw. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. And then they email you and they tell you what your results are. So you're number four. I'm number four. So yeah. So the first three go and now it's your turn. So now it's my turn. What happens? Oh, man. <laughs> a lot. Uh, so I had to figure out what I wanted to do. So with private members bill, you can't have any money allocated to the bill. So you have to get creative on like, what could this mean? Um, a lot of private members bills are like days or something like Nicole Goring had hers on PTSD awareness day. So, you know, that's a good idea. But I wanted to do a bit more than that. Um, and domestic violence came up to me. I've had a lot of constituents in my riding come and talk to me about their experience on it and it kind of was a wake-up call to me I'm like I feel like here's my chance to have a voice this is why I ran um, I really want to stand up for my constituents I want to stand up for women in Alberta because um, for far too long they've been ignored by the previous conservative governments and um, and so I did a lot of consultation it took me a whole summer I talked to many different stakeholders and um, I didn't draft the bill myself. I had a whole community of people help me. I wanted to make sure that it was right. And 
Um, I did get a lot of pushback from landlords, actually, a lot. Really? Yes. Yeah. And that and that's the part which surprised me when I was researching this was that you think this would be an open and shut case. Yeah. You think this would not be an issue where party politics or issues would arise, but there was pushback in this province yeah. about your bill. Yeah. So. Yeah. Did you sit down with people who were pushing back on this and did you hear them out? And what was the big concern that you heard from them? Yeah. Well, I, it, like, it was only landlords. Okay. Everyone else was on board for it, but their concern was that, you know, um, I've heard a lot of cases where people are blacklisted, like women are blacklisted because they have a past, quote unquote past, of an abusive relationship and they don't want damage to their property. And that was their main concern. They're like, we're going to have to pay for that damage. And um, I don't want, I can't afford to do that. But at the same time, you're going to have to pay for the damage no matter who's yeah. in that apartment. That was or, really my rebuttal to that. Yeah. yeah. And that's the part where I just was flabbergasted that people would even consider voicing a concern over it. But but it was funny because when I called them out, I was like, okay, well, are you okay with me, you know, talking about this in the legislature? Or can I post this publicly? No response. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. Well, we don't want to be on, we don't want to be on the record for that. But, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, so. You, you get to first reading. Mm -hmm. That's where usually most private members' bills, like you say, go to die. Yeah. How did you keep it active and how did you get to royal assent? I talked to every single person in that legislature individually and I was like, this is what I'm doing, or the House leaders at least, so yep. they could talk to their caucuses. And um, I'm like, this is what I want to do. I think that this is a nonpartisan bill. We need to, you know, if we're going to work together as a legislature, let's work together. Um, and everyone was on board. Everyone was on board. And I remember when I got to third reading, um, actually my time was almost up. So I had to ask the permission from the House to go straight into royal assent. If one person objected to that, I wouldn't be able to pass the bill. Wow. So I was very happy that I was able to. So were you at the ceremony when the lieutenant governor gave it royal assent? I don't think I was. Oh. I know. Maybe it was. I, I don't know. <laughs> that four years was a blur, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so you you passed the your private members bill. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of MLAs can say that, especially a new MLA, yeah. a first term MLA. Um, that must have given you some pride. Yo, definitely, yeah. So where you said, okay, now I've done it once. Let's try and do it again. Or well, I had my turn. And I tried, but like I said, it's a draw, and I never yeah. had the opportunity to do it again. Um, what was I going to say? But when I was doing my when I was presenting the bill, I remember um, Maria Fitzpatrick. Yep. Emily for Lethbridge. Lethbridge East. East. Yes, West East. is Shannon, and East okay. is yes. Not that I know this. <laughs> So um, she talked about her experience with domestic violence. And because of that, women, we were getting like calls and emails from women across the country being like, I heard the speech. I'm so thankful for what you're doing. Um, this has empowered me to get help. Um, and then BC, you know, went through similar legislation. Saskatchewan went through similar legislation and Ontario. So I'm so happy for that, that people see this legislation as something that's really positive and that can really help people, especially victims of domestic violence escape. So you passed your member's bill. Uh, a few months pass, you get readmitted to the caucus. Yes. So you're back with your fellow MLAs or NDP MLAs. Yeah. What was that moment like? Because you've come a long way. Because I'm not sure what the time frame was, but I think it was a year, a year, almost, yeah. almost a year, 2016. Yeah. Almost May. Uh, so you get readmitted. So what was that like? It was awesome. <laughs> it was so nice. It was. I got the call, and uh, Brian Mason was going to be the one to to do it, and uh, it was at the Scouts Hall in Bonus. Um, no one knew what was going on, but uh, it's like, surprise, I'm back. And I was just so relieved. It was nice to be back with my colleagues. And I never really felt like an independent. I always felt like I was part of the NDP. The caucus. Yeah. So when I talk to female politicians, I have to ask this question. How did you not let social media bring you down? Mm -hmm. The negativity that is on social media today towards female politicians, towards politicians in general, towards everyday people yeah. is just notoriously bad. 
when like did you just have to shut that off and just say you know what we'll post but we're not going to read the comments because you can go down a rabbit hole with that yeah i mean i never had twitter before um until i was an mla and that's really where i received the most hate males hate I don't know. Yeah, I know what you're talking but, about. Yeah. Uh, um, and from the trolls, right? I never responded to the trolls, but it's not like I never saw their comment either. And I think people um, view politicians as just this entity, yeah. not as human beings with like families and a life and emotions. And yeah, like it was... It was hard. I mean, even in the beginning when I was under the spotlight with the media, I was receiving death threats. I remember I had to call the police and be like, I need some sort of security. And they said to me that unless it's a very specific threat on how they're going to kill you, we can't do anything about it. Which I find stupid, but... Yeah, I know. And I was really disappointed with that. I was like, great, so... I was afraid to go into public, to be honest with you. I'm like, I don't know. I don't have security. Yeah. Anything could happen to me. But when I eventually was brave enough to do it and I was like, no, this is my job. I'm going to go in the community. People were so um, supportive. And uh, yeah, because there's that there's that face to face interaction and social media interaction. There's yeah. the keyboard warriors who'd rather type out on social media. Hey, I hate you. You're stupid. Yeah. And then there's the people who will actually be nice to you face to face. So uh, talking to former colleagues of yourself, yours, mm -hmm. um, the NDP caucus was a family. Would that, would that be a statement that you would agree with? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. So when you saw people getting negative comments or yourself getting negative comments, were you able to rely on them and go to them and say, you know what, I need a day, let's go out, let's just relax and do our thing? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, Ricardo was a big friend of mine. <laughs> As you, I think you know yeah, who that guy is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Estefania Cortez Vargas, uh, Michael Connolly, Nicole Goring, Aaron Babcock, John Carson, like we hung out a lot and um, they were my support team and if I felt like I needed a break or if they needed a break we would make sure that we were there for each other okay now I don't know if I should broach this but I'm going to um, in your second year of being an MLA yes. uh, you had a loss in your family yes yeah um, anyone else that I would have pictured would have just backed away from that Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm, I'm assuming I'm okay with talking about this. Yeah. So you yeah, lost your sister. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> as an elected official, as well, let's not even talk about an elected official. As a human being, mm -hmm. what what was the first initial thought when you heard that your sister had passed away? Yeah. So um, this is going to sound weird, um, but. I remember driving to Edmonton. I had my niece in the car, Gwen, who is actually Victoria's daughter. Okay. Um, and my older sister, Jen's now the guardian of Gwen. So, uh, and yes, so we were driving and I remember there was a sunset in the back and I thought to myself, so my mom calls me and she's like, I need to tell you something, but I can't tell you right now. I just knew. I just knew. I don't know why I knew, but I knew. And I'm thinking, Victoria's here. She's with us right now. And when I got to Edmonton, my sister Jen, I saw her and she's like, she told me the news and it was devastating. I mean, it didn't lessen the blow, but um, I just didn't expect that so at all. When you returned to government, when you turn, returned to the legisl legislature, yeah. um, you have this uh, over your shoulders now that you're you not you're not just doing it for yourself, but you're doing it for your sister as well. Yeah, you're trying to make a positive change that people won't go through what your sister went through. Yeah. So, did that change your outlook on life and the day to day governing of what you want to bring forward and how you brought things forward to government? Yeah, definitely. I mean. Uh, it, I mean, I went into politics because I wanted to strengthen women's rights in this province. And I wanted to help women, especially who don't typically have a voice in politics or in, in society, really. And my sister was one of those people. And um, she had a really rough life. 
And you know, this is what I love about the NDP is that we are, we're there for those people. We're not there for, I mean, yes, we're there for everybody, of course, but we want to make sure that everyone's being hurt equally. And when my sister passed, it was just a, a reminder and a motivator for me to, to keep pushing. And even when I, so I saw a medium the second year, um, like of her passing uh, anniversary, I guess it's kind of weird to say that, but yeah. yeah. But, um, <laughs> so she said to me, yeah, your sister's there with you in the legislature. She's there. Like she listens, she knows what you're doing and she's proud of you. And that was enough for me to keep going. So, wow. Yeah. Um, were you able to, uh, be, when politicians are, when female politicians are elected, they are sometimes cast as being the weaker politician. Oh, you don't know what everything's going through. So when this was going on, did you reach out for help because you don't want to seem like you're reaching out for help because you're a female politician? Do you want to prove those people wrong? Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm strong. I can get through this myself. Mm -hmm. Or did you say, you know what? I need to reach out because that's what people do. Yeah. So I did take a month off. Um, and I, I'm such a workaholic that like, it was hard for me not to work, but at the same time I knew I had to take care of myself and, um, and your family and my family, of course. And so I was with my mom basically the whole time and my other sisters and I went and saw a support group for, um, actually funded by the province that help, um, families who their children or relatives have been murdered. So this is like homicidal victims. Um, and it was really eye opening to meet other families on a monthly basis to hear that what they're going through in court and their challenges. And, and it helped me feel better about the situation because it felt like I wasn't alone. And did they get something from you as well? Because they're saying, oh, wow, if it can not just happen to my family, it can happen to politicians as well. That never really came up. I don't, I think they knew who I was and what I did, but I didn't, they didn't want to make me feel on the spot. Okay. So yeah, I, I appreciated that actually. Uh, no, Less that, pressure on me. Well, that's the thing, right? Because yeah. when you're going through that, you want to sort of shut down everything else. And as a politician, you can't always do that, right? Yeah. Um, so we go forward to 2019. Right. Yeah. You're going into an election. The negativity that's in this province was on full force for the NDP. Mm -hmm. You decide to run for re-election. Was that always a... There was no second guessing. I was going to run. I was going to make sure that I was going to win. I was going to run again. Or was it the... Yeah. Um, you know what? I've done so much good in the last four years. I need to try and do this again for the next four. Well, um... It was a tough decision, to be honest with you. Um, like you said, I had a, a bit of a rough four years. Um, my sister's loss was a big thing that, you know, severely impacted my mental health. And um, but at the same time, I loved my job. I absolutely loved it. I loved going in the community and helping people and standing up for them. And um, and so I went back and forth. I'm like, should I just take a step back and focus on my life and with Victoria and my family? And or do I continue to do what I'm doing? And I ultimately came to the decision to run again because I loved it. And um, yeah, so. So one yeah. of the articles I read about you said that you took a negative of from those first few days and you became a star legislator, smart <laughs> star legislator. Yes. Um, I, oh, I yes, forget. really? <laughs> yeah. And I, and I read it. I read the article and like they talked to you and they, they, the, the headline was uh, uh, taking something dark and turning it into a star. And I was like, that's Deborah, that's right? That's so cute. You, I'll, I'll pull it up after oh, we're done okay. here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when you, deci you decided to run again in 2019... What was the attitude like on the doorsteps? Was it like the 2015 election or was it a little bit more dark? Yeah. Well, it depends. I mean, my constituency has a lot of, it's very diverse. Um, yep. So it really depend, depended on which community you were door knocking in. For example, Bonas, overwhelmingly supportive. Yep. Montgomery, very supportive. You go into communities like West Springs, which is higher socioeconomic status, 
not so supportive. Um, people were convinced that we were just we were responsible because um, of people's job losses. We were like, we hate oil and gas. We, this was what people thought. And I, you know, I was very confused. I'm like, how would you think that? You know, we're the ones investing, we're creating jobs. We've put so much work and time into making sure that the Trans Mountain Pipeline gets built. I mean, and I, I questioned them. I said, you know, how do you think Jason Kenney's gonna fix this? Well, he's conservative. Okay, anything else? No. Like, yeah, so it was, um, it was really, yeah. It, it was tough. It was tough. Yeah. So, um, so you're door knocking, you're getting as much help. I'm assuming you have a bigger campaign than you had in 2015. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that must be a little bit more ego boosting to the, to yeah. you to, hey, there's actually more people yeah. who are willing to come out and help. Yeah. Um, it becomes a two-horse race. It becomes a Jason Kenney versus Rachel Notley race. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I, I think even the other parties would agree with that. It became a very left versus right. Yeah. Um, at any time during that campaign, did you ever think to yourself, you know what, I'm just going to throw in the towel? Or you know, you said, you know what, I'm going to run this out and I'm going to win this thing. Yeah. It was funny you said that because even the Alberta candidate came to my office one time, my campaign office, yeah. and was like, I'm really scared of of the UCP candidate. I'm like, what do you mean? Well, I just find him really intimidating. So, yeah, I just felt like, why are you here? <laughs> why are you telling me this? What, what's going yeah. on here? <laughs> um, but yeah, so obviously it was between race. Rachel Nolly and Jason Kenny and um, no, I never once thought I was gonna quit. I wanted to go through it. And I, and you say that story about the Alberta Party candidate. We had yeah. that happen as well. Uh, Ricardo and I went to uh, I forget the university in it's the major university in varsity. Oh, uh, UFC? UFC, yes. yes. And we went to a radio station, and afterwards we talked to a uh, candidate from another party, and he said, you know, what if I wasn't running, uh, I would be voting for you, because yeah. I don't want Jason Kenney. Exactly. And that's the that was the issue. So do you think that the divide of the left from those three parties had a major influence on some of the writings? That's a good question. I think so. Okay. Um, yeah. Like, did you, when you knocked on doors, because... Like, I door knocked for Ricardo, I door knocked for Danielle, yeah. and we heard, oh, I'm voting for the Alberta Party. Yeah, I did like, hear that too. Yeah. We're voting for the Liberal Party. It's like, okay, but you realize that's a vote for, and I hate to say it this way because you really should vote for whoever you want, but. Yeah, it's a it's, wasted vote. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So. I said the same thing. Okay, so it yeah. wasn't just me then. Yeah. That's good to hear because yeah. it was like, is it um, election day? Yeah. So first off, well, backtrack a second. Okay. You're running against, I, I do not know how oh, to pronounce this. Demetrios name. Nicolaitis. Yes, the now Minister of Advanced <sighs> Education. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> you. You get to know him over the campaign because I'm assuming you meet him at a few uh, yeah. campaign debates. And I also want to note that um, I found it interesting when I was door knocking. I heard a lot of people say to me, oh, yes, we met Dimitros. And in fact, he said that if he was elected, that he would get a higher up position in the party, in the caucus. So I feels like Jason Kenney was promising positions in his ministry. Um and uh, which is actually illegal. Yeah. And I know that Rachel Notley never did that. So I think he was using that to kind of convince people to vote for him. I didn't know he was going to be the next advanced education minister, um, but scary. It's very scary right now. Yeah. So yeah. election night in 2019. Yeah. That green check mark does not appear beside your name. No. What's the first thought that goes through your head? Hmm. I'm back to being a private citizen, or I I feel bad for what the province is going to go through in the next four years. Yeah, it was. I feel bad for what's going to happen because I knew it was going to be horrible. I knew it was going to be like Ralph Klein, and it wasn't just me not winning. I mean, yes, that is disappointing because you do put in a lot of your time, and um, but it was more so what's going to happen to this province. It was just crushing. And did you, you, the NDP didn't hold on to Edmonton, they held on to a few seats in Calgary and Lethbridge as well. Yeah. Uh, did you look at that and say, you know what, um, 
while we might be in opposition, while the my former colleagues might be in opposition, but they have a strong base, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, Rachel Notley is a good leader. She's going to be able to uh, run circles around Jason Kenny potentially. Uh, oh, yeah, definitely. So when you go back to your private life, what's your first thought? What am I going to do? Go back to school, finish off that degree? Yeah, I think that was the first thought was I need to finish my degree. That's something positive for me to focus on. Um, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. It's been rough. It's It's been hard uh, adjusting back to just being a private citizen because I loved, I really loved my job. Like, I loved going to work and... I mean, yeah, some parts of it was tough, like going to Edmonton every Sunday was, <laughs> I mean, but it's, it's something, I, I'm a workaholic. I love to work all the time. I love to be busy. And for me now to have all this extra time, it's like, what do I do with myself? So. As my husband has learned, catch up on sleep. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, looking back on the last four years, the last four years, would you have done anything different? Obviously, the social media stuff. No, yeah. no not even just that. Not even that. Yeah. Let's talk about your time in government. Okay. Would you have pushed forward on issues, more issues? Would you have done, would you have tried to pass more bills or would you have tried to get your caucus to pass more private members' bills? Mm-hmm. What would you have done differently in government? <laughs> Um, that's a good question. Because when I talked to Danielle, and she said this on her uh, episode of the podcast, is um, if I would have known now that we were only going to be in there for four years, we would have made more changes. But we didn't want to rattle the cage too much, right? Yeah. Because yeah. it's a new government. It's yeah. a new party in a government. You don't want to try and be defeated in the first year. Right. So would you would you say that would be your case too, that you would try to pass more things because you knew you only had a short period of time? Yeah. And actually, I'm taking a woman in politics class right now. And one thing I didn't realize was that female premiers in Canada historically um, don't make it past the first term. And... Um, yep. I mean, there has been a couple exceptions, but they don't stay very long. And now, right now, in Canada, we have zero female premiers. One. Do we? We have one. Who is it? Northwest Territories. Oh. Consensus government. (laughs) Well, hey, there you go. (laughs) Thank God. (laughs) We do have one because I remember watching that ceremony and going, oh, my God. Not, oh, my God, like, as a bad thing, but, like, oh, my God, we actually have a female politician again. Yeah. Well, that's great. I didn't know that. There you go. Congratulations to her. (laughs) Exactly. And if I'm not mistaken, her cabinet is I think there's 18 MLAs up there her cabinet's nine people yeah nine of them are in cabinet and if I'm not mistaken in Northwest Territories the majority of them not equal the majority of them are women woohoo so the majority of women majority of Northwest Territory government quote unquote government is women right so that must be that's a, awesome. A change of pace. Yeah. So yeah. Um, when you're talking about you're doing a women's in politics, it must yeah. be hard because you must be going, well, I was a woman in politics, yeah. so can <laughs> I just teach the class? Oh, you don't even know. <laughs> I'm like, it's hard for me because I don't want to be the one person always raising my hand be like, hi, like, I know everything. But, but come on, <laughs> you do, though. I can teach this class. <laughs> but no, um, and actually my professor is Lori Williams, and she He's usually the one to do interviews, like, to talk about um, politics. Um, I don't know which news station she's been on or either way, but she's quite well known in Calgary. Um, she's a huge fan of Rachel Notley's. She talks her up a lot. Okay. Um, and because, you know, she's like, she knew what she was doing, even with the backlash, even with the negativity thrown her way thrown her family's way she continued to power through and um, a lot of people noticed that so so but to answer your question though okay. I never got to your question um, one thing I will say and I think this is an, a new democrat thing is that we tend to do a lot like new democrats love legislation and policy they love it I think I mean I love the things that we did in government I think positive changes all around but I feel like we did too much in a short period of time Okay. because just me and my experience going to the door, people didn't know about what we did because there was just so much of it. So they didn't know what to focus on and I kind of had to pick and choose what I wanted to focus on. And And would you say that you might have done a lot, but the media only covered the oil and gas? Yeah. (laughs) 
Literally, yeah. 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 Because that's what I heard when I was door knocking with Ricardo and Danielle is they they did talk about, oh, what did you do for this? And you'd have to explain, even though it's been three years since you've passed that legislation, right? Mm -hmm. So the media was stuck because as much as Jason Kenney, I think, is, I, I don't want to say disastrous for this province because I think, you know what, there's good in everyone. I know some people might not agree with that. Um, he was able to change the narrative. He's He is the master of the narrative, right? Yeah, yeah. He's able to get his narrative and just run with it. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> women in politics, though, the question goes back to, if you had a daughter mm -hmm. and she came to you and said, I want to run for politics, would you think that was a good idea or a bad idea? Well. In today's culture. <laughs> I mean, I don't have children, but I am with my nieces. I'm quite close with them. They're yep. young kids. And they've been involved with, like, this entire process of the four years of me going to events. Um, they just see me as the politician. We're always talking about it, and I'm always encouraging them. You need, you're going to be the next premier. You're going to be the next MLA. Like, what would you think about um, running? And they're always like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm doing that on purpose because I want children and the younger generation to think that they're able to, that they actually have that option to as a right. Do you think more women need to get into politics? Yeah. And how do we get them? How do you, how do we as a society uh, get more women active in politics and make that decision to run? Because let's be honest, uh, the quote unquote image of a woman is to stay at home, yeah, be with their kids. Politics, as you know, for the last four years, is a nine to twelve job. Yeah, yeah. So, how do you get more women in politics when the idea is not to be away from your children or yeah. be in a position of quote unquote power? Right, and also being in office means that you're giving up a lot. Like, there's a lot of barriers for women being in politics because childcare issues, they're away from their family a lot. Um, you think a government would pass $25 a day daycare? You know. <laughs> and keep it. Yeah. It's one of the things that we did. But, um, but yeah, I mean, even with the legislature, uh, they didn't even have women washrooms for the longest time. Actually, our government was the first government to even put in changing stations in the women's washrooms in the legislature. That wasn't even a thing before. So it just goes to show how patriarchal politics is. Um, and I, I think with the younger generation, um, that's going to change. Do you see the rise of uh, people like Greta Thunberg as a positive step for oh, women? Oh, yeah, definitely. I really admire what she's doing. I think that um, to be a 16-year-old, to have that much fame and that, like, that spotlight on you and to have that voice is huge. And um, it's empowering other young women to think, oh, I can do that too. That's the thing. Like, with women, it's, oh, you know, t this is usually what the case is. That women's like, well, I, I'm not qualified. I'm not experienced enough. I'm not educated enough to do it. Whereas men are typically more like, yeah, sign me up. What can I do to help, right? But women need to be convinced more because they feel like they just don't have the qualifications. And so... If they see other women doing these things, maybe that might change their mind. Who were your uh, Who were your role models as a child, as a woman thinking about going into politics? Who were your role models, and who were your role models as women in general? Ooh, <laughs> the million dollar question. Oh. <laughs> I didn't uh, think that one. I just not, threw that one. Yeah. Um, I think Nikki Ashton was a big one because my sister was, she worked for her for a long time and I really was inspired by her activism. Um, she never, um, she never went back and forth with issues. She was just like, this is my opinion. This is what I think we need to do. And here's why. And I love that about her. She's very practical in that way. Um, I mean, there's not a lot of women in my generation growing up being like, oh, yeah, this is someone I really look up to because it's really male dominated out there. Yeah. So it's hard to answer that question. Yeah. I really, my family, my grandma in particular, she's the matriarch of the family. She pretty much raised me and she's a very 
independent person. Um, and I think that's ingrained in my brain. That's why I'm super independent. And this is probably why I like politics so much because it's kind of need that personality to get into it. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. It but, does. It yeah. does because it sounds like, uh, your grandmother, mm -hmm. um, sort of is the woman you looked up to as a child and you sort of brought that into your government role yeah. I assume I so. mean she's in Rotary and she you know Rotary used to be a men's only club she was the first um, pres female president of a Rotary club wow ever so I mean she's always been in male dominated fields but always killed it and never really cared about it it's like you know this is my job I need to do it and uh, and now she she like loves the NDP before she was conservative but I think because that's how everyone voted. But now that she really saw what the conservatives are actually about, she's like, ugh, no, no, no. How like, can I vote for that? Yeah. And how can I get more involved in this party and do what I need to do? So, so the next group of questions yeah. is the future. The future. Let's let's start with the future of Alberta. We have a conservative government. We have Jason Kenney as premier. What do you see as the future of Alberta in the next four, six, ten years under a Kenny leadership and under a uh, conservative government? Mm -hmm. um, is you, you, you're active on social media still. Yes. I see your tweets from time to time, <laughs> like chirping at some of the uh, uh, MLAs who are now in government. Yeah. So... What do you think the next four years or six years are going to be like under this government? Austerity. I think there's going to be a lot of pain. Um, I, I think people are angry right now. I know in particular um, at Royal University, actually, when I was campaigning, I met with a, a professor. She was saying that they were already... Uh, they already were saving up for um, a just-in-case scenario. So they already had a reserve fund put aside because they knew that there was going to be massive cuts to post-secondary. And look, here we are. <laughs> Budget just came down last week. And yeah. when you're talking to other students in your class... Do they talk about, hey, you know what, this is going to be hard for the next four years because oh, yeah, yeah. the tuition is going to go up? And People are really worried. Are yes. they? Are yeah. you? Oh, yes. Of course <laughs> I am. I mean, come on. How could you not? Like, even lifting the cap on tuition, it's a huge barrier for a lot of young people because... The cost to even get into university, the cost to maintain your courses, I mean, a course is typically between five to seven hundred dollars. And on top of that, you have to pay for your books. And so now it's going to increase 30 percent in the next three years. Like, just think of that. And so I don't know how many people are going to be able to maintain their education. And that's a big problem. Do you think that uh, Alberta will be, again, ever governed by an NDP government? Yes, I do. Really? Because I think that they're going to see the destruction of Jason Kenney and his government. They're going to see the... I'm trying to be as polite as I can. <laughs> Um, hey, if any of the Jason Kenney <laughs> workers want to follow us and tweet us, go right ahead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Come at me, bro. Exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, it's not just students, it's nurses, it's teachers. Like, people are are fearful for their job security, they're fear for, fearful for their next paycheck. Uh, students' classroom sizes are already huge. Like, I don't understand where their logic's coming from. If they really, truly care about Albertans, why are they doing this? And frankly, the budget, I mean, don't they have a bigger deficit than we would have had? Yep. And wasn't that their major critique of our party? I just don't understand it. Like, And if I'm not mistaken, I'm not, I don't know the full details. They introduced a carbon tax this week. Oh, I didn't hear about that. Yes. If I'm not mistaken, they introduced, they are going to tax big polluters $30 a ton on only big polluters and it's going to be a tax on them and it's going to increase every year <laughs> i don't know if i got my full details right here but okay. I, I, I i like i remember reading i think it was michelle belfontaine right her article and i was like wait a second 
the, like they were just in the like literally yep. nine months ago saying carbon tax is the worst type Scrap of tax. Scrap the carbon tax. And yeah. now they're adding it to big polluters. And my mm-hmm. issue is, who are the big polluters going to pass it on to? You and I, the consumer. Of course. Wow. <coughs> so it just goes to show the hypocrisy in that party and that government. I'm sorry, but that's just. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, anyway. What does the future hold for Deborah? Uh, well, I want to finish my degree. I think I have in... Well, my plan is to be done by 2022. Uh, hopefully, if I can continue to afford my education, but either way. Um, and... I really want to work for a not-for-profit. Um, I want to get, I want to be a social worker. I mean, that's my ultimate goal. And uh, I've talked to people like Richard Fian, who's uh, who's a social worker. He said he was going to help me out. And Nicole Goring. And, um, There's and, a few yeah. social workers in your caucus Yeah, time. yeah. So, you know, uh, that's pretty much where I'm looking right now. I can't look too far ahead in the future, but... So why social worker? Well, I enjoy helping people. And for me, like with my life, I never had the perfect life. I don't think anyone has. Um, I've had social workers my whole entire life. And so I know what it's like to be a kid in the system. And I know how tough it can be. And so I want to be there for other kids who are going through that. So we're going to ask the question that I, I, I said I wasn't going to tell you any questions, but I told you this question at the beginning of the podcast and you were unsure about the answer, but I want to hear it. Does Deborah Drever ever run for politics again? Uh, it's a hard maybe. <laughs> I, I really am thinking about it. I'm considering it. Um, yeah. Federally, provincially, municipally? Any of the above? I Unsure think right now? It would be provincially, if anything. Um, I like the ideology. I like the partisan politics. Um, municipally, I just think that would... I mean, listen, I think that city councillors go through a lot. They have to put up with a lot. Um, it's a lot of work. There's, they're the front line of politics. Yeah, and... Their jobs are not easy. However, am I agreeing with everything that city council is doing now? No. But um, I do commend them for their work as a um, as someone in, in office. It is hard to do that job. But And federally, I wouldn't do it because it's just, frankly, traveling to Ottawa that much is, no, I just don't want to do that. Um, but, yeah, I I enjoyed provincial politics, and it, maybe I'll do it again. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> Who knows? Yes. Yeah, stay, um, <laughs> stay tuned. Stay tuned. Tuned is right. Yeah. Um, Deborah, thank you very much for doing this. Yeah, my really pleasure. appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, you get all these invites to do more podcasts now yes. because I've broken that barrier and you can just go out and do it. <laughs> and it's right. perfect timing because uh, your episode airs tomorrow. Okay. And then the following week, we're just talking about women's issues ah. with women from all backgrounds. We uh, were talking about, uh, t- I talked to a woman from uh, Toronto. Uh, mom and uh, mother and daughter, uh, a woman who we broached the subject, which I never thought we would, uh, Roe versus Wade, oh, yeah. which I thought, wow. So yeah. thank you very much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. So and uh, as I've had people in the past, and I'll say this to you. Once we get good reception from this podcast, which we always do, mm-hmm. we will have you back. Oh, Just stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. And thank you very much yet again to our guest today and to you, the listeners. Uh, As I've said in the past, without listeners, we wouldn't be able to do this podcast. So thank you very much. If you haven't already, like us on Facebook, like us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram. Uh, Just we want to get our word out that we're just starting an open conversation, an open and honest conversation with everyone. Uh, We're trying to get away from the 140 character tweets and start that conversation. So thank you very much once again. Like us, subscribe to our podcast, share it with your friends and family, start that conversation yourself. Just get out there and start talking. Get out from behind the keyboard and enjoy this community because we're all different and we all have great stories to tell. So with that, you've been listening to the Cross Border Interview Podcast, a subsidiary of Miranda Brown and Associates Incorporated. Thanks very much and have yourself an excellent week.